gospel. Listen, we started a series, Jonah, last week, and we're going to continue that. The title of this message under the series, Jonah, is I Called You and You Answered. So the story of Jonah is really all of our story at some point. Maybe at, through this series, you, you'll see yourself. You'll see Jonah in you. Regardless of which path you choose in life, obedience or rebellion, God is always the God of another chance. He's not the God of the first or second. He's the God of another chance. How many of y'all needed more than two chances with God? Thank God he's not the God of the second chance, even though he is, but he's, thank God he's the God of the third, fourth, fifth, what, the hundred thousandth, if you're like me, millionth. Yeah, okay, thank God. But he's the God of another chance. And while we can run from God, you cannot outrun God. So even in our disobedience and rebellion, we are constantly reminded of God's faithfulness and that salvation is through him and him alone. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me, or depending on what translation you read, or through me. In other words, folks, no one gets to God unless they go through Jesus Christ. Nobody. God, the God we serve, is the only true God. Every other small G-O-D is a fictional God. It's not real. There's only one real God, and that's the one we serve if you belong to Jesus, and you get to him through Jesus. And it's interesting as Jesus is talking to Jewish people, and as he's telling them, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, that he, that when he says those words, the Jewish people knew that when Moses went to deliver the children from the Egyptians, that he asked God at the burning bush, he said, God, who shall I say sent me? And God says, I am that I am sent you. And Jesus was telling the people of that day when he was saying, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, he was saying, and they knew he was saying, I'm God. I'm God come in the flesh so you can see who I am, how merciful and compassionate and loving and how much I love you. So he was even telling them then when he said, I am, those words, they knew he was saying, oh my gosh, he's saying he's God. Jesus was constantly working and striving to let people know who he was in that day, and he's still doing it today. So when we call on God, he always answers us in mercy and grace, despite the situations we have put ourselves in. So many of us act in a way, do things in a way, talk in a way, and we find ourselves in situations that we put ourselves in and then somehow we get mad or angry with God because we're in those situations when God didn't want you to be in them anyway. And so a lot of times we put ourselves in a situation, but I want you to understand regardless of that, God will answer his children, those that are born again and believers, always with mercy and grace. See, God is merciful and long-suffering even when we sin against him. What seems like punishment and I want you to hear this, God never punishes his own. If you are a born-again child of God, he never punishes you. And what we need to understand that actually that when he works with us or helps us, that when his long-suffering and mercy, he wants to help us understand his salvation, that God uses these situations with his mercy and his grace to bring you and I to a place where we believe in Jesus and we walk with him. See, God doesn't punish his own. He chastises them. Or another way to say chastisement is discipline because we don't use chastise. Have you been chastised today? No, but, but we'll say have you been disciplined or corrected. And so God is working and he, and he works with us as his children, sons and daughters. He corrects and disciplines us, he never punishes us. And I think that's huge for the body of Christ. So if you go to Jonah chapter one, starting at verse 17, and then I'm gonna read the whole chapter of Jonah two, and I know some people, the way they think, I stopped reading at verse 16 last week, and I could hear people like almost saying like, why didn't he read the last verse? And the answer is because I didn't want to. 
Just saying. Well, why didn't you want to? Because. But I'm going to read it today. Jonah 1.17, now the Lord had arranged for a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was inside the fish for three days and three nights. Let me say this I won't, uh, again. I'll probably say it again next week. Jonah is just not a story for children. And that's how we see Jonah in the whales, like, well, that's a children's story. Jonah's in the Bible for a reason, and it's much bigger than that. It's more than just him being swallowed by a fish. It's, it's bigger than that. So it's not just a children's story. It's a story for all of us. Chapter 2. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord after this big fish swallowed him, his God from inside the fish. He said, I cried out to the Lord in my great trouble, and I love this, and he answered me. Now Jonah put himself in that situation, but God answered him. Regardless of the situation you put yourself into, what you need to know and believe and understand is God will answer you. He'll hear you and answer you. I called to you from the land of the dead, and the Lord, and Lord, you heard me. See, he thought he was dead when they threw him in the, in the ocean. You threw me into the ocean depths, and I sank down to the heart of the sea. The mighty waters engulfed me. I was buried beneath your wild and stormy waves. Then I said, O oh Lord, you have driven me from your presence. Yet I will look once more towards your holy temple. I sank beneath the waves, and the waters closed over me. Seaweed wrapped itself around my head. I sank down to the very roots of the mountains. I was imprisoned in the earth, whose gates locked shut forever. But you, O oh Lord my God, snatched me from the jaws of death. As my life was slipping away, I remembered the Lord, and my earnest prayer went out to you in your holy temple. Those who worship false gods, turn their backs on all God's mercies. But I will offer sacrifices to you with songs of praise, and I will fulfill all my vows. For my salvation comes from the Lord alone. Then the Lord ordered the fish to spit Jonah out onto the beach. As you see, Jonah did not even cry out for God to deliver him, really. He began to praise God and worship him and saying, God, I know I blew it. I know that, that I blew it so much. And what happened was Jonah was told by God to go to Nineveh to preach the gospel, basically, to tell them about God. Jonah, who hated the Assyrians, who hated the Ninevites, because they were the worst of the worst people on the earth. They were horrific, they were cruel, they were butchers, they were, they were just awful human beings. Probably some of Jonah's friends or family, people he knew had been killed by the Ninevites. And now God says to him, you need to go talk to them. But Jonah's like, I'm not going. He runs, goes, gets on a ship, thinking he can run from God. When he gets on the ship, God sends a storm. The storm comes. The, the, the men on that ship were praying to their gods, which are false gods, which aren't real. So they didn't get answered. The captain goes down to Jonah. He's asleep in the hold. And he goes, come on, man, get up. Pray to your God that he might hear us and save us, or he might hear you and save us. So Jonah goes up, and they cast lots, and the lots fell on Jonah. And they said, what did you do, man? And Jonah said, hey, you got to throw me overboard. And those guys were decent people, obviously. They began to row harder. They didn't want to throw him overboard. So when they, couldn't, when they couldn't outdo the storm, the storm was getting worse. They finally took Jonah, and before they did, they prayed to Jonah's God that they didn't even know at the time and said, please don't hold his death unto us. We're doing this because we're supposed to, I guess. So they take Jonah, throw him overboard, and then the storm calms immediately, and these men gave sacrifice to our God and said they'd serve him forever. So when you look at the story of Jonah, he hated the Ninevites. He hated these people. But let me pause here for a moment to talk about the difference between God's punishment and God's discipline or chastisement. Hebrews 12, 5 says, And have you forgotten the encouraging words God spoke to you as his children? He said, My child, don't make light of the Lord's discipline and don't give up when he corrects you. See, we need to understand the difference between divine punishment and divine chastisement or discipline, or correction. And if you are a child of God, you will not be punished for your sins. And here's why. 
For God has already punished them at the cross. 1 John 1, 7 says, But if you are living in the light as God is in the light, then we have fellowship with each other, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Jesus was punished and sacrificed for our sin, so we no longer have to be punished for our sin because Jesus took that on the cross when he died, and that that punishment was paid. And that's the good news. So there's a difference. Punishment is the act, or God acts as a judge. When you're not born again, when you have not received Jesus, you're not living for him, then God becomes a judge to you. And the sentence of punishment is the act of a judge. A penal sentence passed on those charged with guilt. So if you're a non-believer in here, then the God's punishment will be on your life. His judgment, he be, he's not a father to you or God, he's a judge to your life. And when you die, he decides who goes to heaven and hell. Now, there's a lot of people that don't even believe there's a hell. But if you read the Bible at all, there is a hell. There's a hell to shun and a heaven to gain. And God gets to decide who goes where. I hear people talking about, I, I want a big mansion in heaven or I'm going to have a big mansion. Me, I just want to be allowed in. I mean... What you don't want, if we go, whatever the pearly gates are, wherever, how we get there, I don't want some dude, Peter, whoever, standing at the gates, and I say, hey, my name's Steve Smum. He goes, mm. I don't want no mms. I don't care if it's a shack on the side of the road. I don't care if it's a shack at all. I just want, come on in, dude. You get to make it. You made it. So, so <laughs> if you don't, You know, it's interesting when you take communion, it's the elements. You know, the juice represents the blood and the bread represents the body of Jesus. God says to judge yourself. So he won't have to judge you. And it's interesting to me that when you ask Jesus to become Lord of your life, and I thought about this. I've never heard it taught. I just, as I was meditating, the, the thought came to me that you are judging your life when you ask Jesus to come to your life because you're saying, God, Without you, I'm lacking. Without you, I'm empty. Because there's a place in us only God can fill. Now, we may try to fill it with sex and alcohol and drugs and the pleasures of this life. And the reason those things are fleeting is because they never last, is because they're never meant to fulfill this place in us. It's, it's only for God to sit on. And when God fills it, now we're filled. Now we're not looking for different things. And it's not fleeting. And so when you judge yourself, when I said, Jesus, be Lord of my life, God says, good, you judge yourself and you realize you are lacking, that you needed something in your life. And I didn't even know. I mean, I was having a good time in college. And, and, and yet there was something in me that said there's something not quite right. And so when you've done that, you've judged yourself. And the greatest thing is when you judge yourself, then he becomes your father and he's not your judge. And God wants to help us. So... Punishment is the act of a judge. 1 Peter 2.24 says he personally carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. By By his wounds you were healed or are healed. See, in other words, the Christian cannot be punished or condemned, yet he may be disciplined and corrected, chastised. The true believer is totally different than the non believer The believer is a member of the family of God. The relationship that exists is that of a parent and a child. And so God wants us to understand that that's when it happens. That that you, when you're a born-again believer, you become part of the family and God becomes your father. And the relationship that now exists is a parent and a child. When I raised my son and my daughters when they were young, they're older now. When I raised them, you know what, guys, I never punished them. And the reason I never punished them is because they weren't criminals. I corrected them. I disciplined them. And sometimes correction and discipline is not fun. Come on. And I corrected them with the rod sometimes. And, you know, I never lied to them either. I never told them, this is going to hurt me more than it's going to hurt you. I never lied. I said, this is going to hurt you a lot more than it's going to hurt me. (laughs) I never hit them with my hand. I never smacked them. But, boy, I put the rod on their little behinds. And I watched that foolishness drive from from them. I mean, it was like, woo, and it came out and it left. 
And I would let them cry for a little bit because some people, you know, you get disciplined and cry. Quick cry, quick cry. Well, it hurts. Let them cry it out. Then look at them say, okay, that's enough. And then I prayed with them. I believed God with them. And we moved on in life. We never brought it up again because we're supposed to teach them about God. And so if you keep bringing up the past sins of all your children, especially when they're like five and six, and you keep saying, you always do that. Well, where's the forgiveness of God? And we don't punish our children. We correct them. You know why? Because we love them. They're not criminals. The criminals get punished. Our children get disciplined and corrected. And we just want to steer their behavior so they do right. That's what we want to do as parents. That's all God is saying. I don't want to punish you. I want, I want to help you. And in helping you, i got to correct you. And sometimes that correction and discipline is no bueno. It's no fun. It's not good. It's, sometimes it's painful and sometimes very frustrating. Sometimes it's like, man, it looks like my whole life's falling apart. And it's not really falling apart. It just seems that way. But God is trying to steer you and correct you so you get your life right. And then all of a sudden, peace comes. And so God is our Father, and that's the relationship. As a son and daughter, we must be disciplined, corrected for wrongdoing. We must be. See, God punishes his enemies. And this mentality that goes around, well, I'm a good person, so surely God has to let me go to heaven. Folks, we need to understand this very clearly. That is not, uh, that's not healthy, it's not smart, it's kind of dumb, really. That you're looking at God who is holy and saying, God, I'm a good person, so therefore I don't have to go through the channel of Jesus to go to heaven. I can just go there because I'm so good. The problem is, when we say we're good, we're comparing ourselves to other humans. So when you compare yourself to Charles Manson, you would be considered an incredible person. The problem is, we're not comparing ourselves amongst each other. We're being compared to a holy God, and what God said is, you always come up lacking. You can never be good enough. That philosophy is going to send people to hell and to God's punishment, not to heaven. And so I know, you should know, we can never be good enough for God. So God sent Jesus as a sacrifice and said, I'll take all the punishment you deserve. Jesus said, I'll take it on me. So now you can have a relationship with God as a father and a son or a father and a daughter. And now God is trying to help you. He doesn't want to punish you. But if you're a non-believer, Listen, there's only two places people go when they die. They either go to heaven or hell. There's no purgatory. There's no middle place. There's no holding tank. There's none of that. And he's in charge of both. And the decisions you make today could be the decisions that will affect you for eternity. And God is trying to show you his goodness how great he is, how kind. So we realize punishment is retributive. Punishment inflicted, that's what it means, punishment inflicted on someone or as vengeance for a wrong or criminal act. Discipline or chastisement is remedial. It's giving or intended as a remedy. I love this, as a remedy or a cure. One flows from his anger, the punishment. The other from his love. He's trying to help us. God is disciplining us because it's a remedy and a cure for what ails us. He's just trying to help us get right and do right. So he chastises us, corrects us, disciplines us for our well-being. Not because he's mad or angry, because he loves us and he cares for you. Hebrews 12, 9 and 10 basically says our earthly parents chastised us or corrected us for their pleasure. But God disciplines us for his profit. I mean, for our profit. In other words, he does it for us, to profit us, to help us, to encourage us, to prosper us, if you would. Romans 2, 4 says, Or do you have no regard for the wealth of his kindness and tolerance and patience in withholding his wrath? Are you actually unaware or ignorant of the fact that God's kindness leads you to repentance? And here's what repentance means here. It means that is to change your inner self, your old way of thinking, and seek his purpose for your life, that when you and I, we get born again and we come and repent to God, that now, we, now it changes who we are on the inside, and it's supposed to start working to change the way we think and process, and now we're to seek his purpose for our life, 
not just what you want to do. It's not the American dream. It's what God wants us to do. Because people truly are lovers of pleasure in this world. We had a speaker up here that said this. He just said it real quickly. I haven't quit thinking. I've not stopped thinking about it since he said it. We're lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. We want to fulfill all of our dreams before Jesus comes back. Jesus, you can't come back. I haven't been married yet. I don't have kids. I want to be a grandparent. I want to graduate school. I want to get a job. I want to have a house. And, and it's like we want all these things to me. If Jesus comes back today, I'm okay. Why? Because we have to be lovers of God more than lovers of the pleasures of the world. That doesn't mean the pleasures are evil or wrong because we want to, hopefully you want to go to school and hopefully you want to get a good job and hopefully you want to get married and have children and raise them and be a grandparent. Because I'm telling you, if you're not a grandparent yet, it's the greatest thing in the world. Grandparents used to tell me, don't you wish you had your grandkids before your children? And I'd say no, but now it's like, absolutely because unless my grandchildren are just being rude, I don't correct them. I just love them. Give them whatever they want. But I've had to teach my oldest grandson that some things stay among men. We went out and did something one day, and he, he came home and said, Mom, look what, we, look what Papa and I did. And, I'm, and the, now his mom and his, my wife are standing at me like, you took him and did what? I'm, so I pulled him aside. I said, dude, dude, you got to learn this right now as a little man. That some things stay, you don't tell on Papa like that. <laughs> and then I had to get angry with my wife, like, don't look at me like that. You're not my boss. You're not the boss of me. <laughs> then, I, then we get in an argument. I'll do what I want when I want. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> so when God had Jonah thrown overboard, he wasn't punishing him. He was saving him. Now, a lot of people who think of Jonah the whale like it could never happen. Like, th there's no way. It's impossible. But that's not true. I want to read a story to you, and they're going to show you a picture on the screen. Listen to this story. This is Dr. Harry Rimmer. And at the end of his name, he has D-D-S-C-D. I have no idea what that means, but I know it means that somehow he's important, Right? The more initials you have after your name, the more important you are, or the smarter, whatever. But he tells of personally meeting a sailor who fell overboard from a trawler in the English Channel and was swallowed by a gigantic whale shark. The entire trawler fleet set out to hunt the shark down, and 48 hours after the accident, the shark was sighted and slain with a one-pound deck gun. The carcass was too heavy for the ship's winches to handle. So the crew towed it to shore, intending to give their friend a Christian burial. When the shark was open, the man was found unconscious but alive. He was rushed to the hospital where he was found to be suffering from shock alone. I'd be shocked too. <laughs> and was later discharged. He was on exhibit in a London museum at a shilling admission and was advertised as the Jonah of the 20th century. So here's what we know about the whale shark is they don't have really teeth. They just suck you in. Now, now I'm going to have to think about when I go in the ocean, man, I hope no whale shark comes. I don't want to be sucked in anywhere. <laughs> but they, they suck you in and, because they eat plankton. But the esophagus of that whale shark is too small to swallow a human, so he was held in the mouth. So when people say it's impossible that this story could ever be true, here's what you and I need to understand. Nothing's impossible with God. True. So... So when we're talking about God's love and his mercy, even for those who are wretched and lost and the worst of the worst, and we think we're good, I want, to, I want you to hear this. Now, this is how a great father operates. Here, here's how we know our father is so incredibly merciful and gracious. The Assyrians that lived in Nineveh, which Nineveh is the capital of, worshipped Dagon, which is basically a fish god. So picture this. You're on the coast, and your god is a giant fish. Everybody got that? You're on the coast, and your god is a giant fish, and you're worshiping him. Like, oh, should have bought a Honda, should have bought a Honda. 
And as you're worshiping your giant fish, because you think it is a God, a giant fish comes from the ocean and vomits out a man. (laughs) Jonah, if he was any kind of athlete, had to land on his feet. So here comes a man out of a fish, a great big fish, and you worship a fish god, and here comes a man, can you imagine taking all the junk off him? He's talking about seaweed, and he's taking it off. Don't you think you would listen to that man if your God threw him up? And so God so loved the Ninevites that he even gave him a sign. So when we talk about Jonah going overboard and being punished, that was really his salvation. If he stayed on the ship, he would have died with all of them. But because he did what God wanted him to do and went in the water, we think it's the punishment of God, but really it was the salvation of God. Because if he hadn't have gotten in the water, the fish wouldn't have eaten them. And it was not only for Jonah and the love God had for Jonah, it was the love God had for those who were wretched and lost. Because he even, he said, you know what? I love Jonah and I love the Ninevites. I want them to repent. So Jonah comes up, perfect 10. And when he comes up, he goes to the Ninevites, finally. And when he goes, he, it's like this. Hey, man, God loves you. God's real. Because he hated them. He wanted them to die. He's like, God, I know if I go over there, you're merciful and compassionate. You'll do something, and they'll get right, and they'll live. So he preached awful. Come on. I mean, he was he wasn't even trying. Like, ah, if you want to receive God, receive God. I don't care what you do, man. And isn't it ironic that how Jesus even talks of Jonah, that Jonah, who didn't even care, preached so hard. I mean, he didn't preach hard at all. And the whole city repented. And Jesus, who is the Son of God, preached so carefully and with the the greatest messages you'll ever hear. And very few repented. Even very few repent in our world today. So when you look at God and you look at, is he my father? You got to realize that he doesn't want to punish you. He just wants to help you. To the unbeliever, you'll be punished. Your punishment will be horrific. I mean, one of the reasons I serve God of many is because I don't want to go to hell. I'm afraid of hell. I've had dudes walk up to me, big dudes, bad dudes. Say, oh, I'm going to go to hell. Me and Satan are going to rule that place. The problem is Satan doesn't rule anything. He ain't going to rule nothing. But God's compassion and his kindness is what he's trying to reach out to all of us. And say, don't you understand? You may blow it and make mistakes. We all do. But I don't want to punish you for those. I may correct you and discipline you. And for the time, correction's not good. It's not, we don't like it. Your life may get really frustrated. It may seem like nothing's working out for you. He can affect you financially because it seems like finance, money is the God of our world today. And if our, you know, my wife can dislike me. My husband can, you know, if, you have, if your wife has a husband, she can dislike me. But if my money's not doing well, now I'm upset. And, and God can use all these means to help get our attention so that we'll, get, quit, we'll stop running from him and run to him. See, God is always trying to look out for your best interests. That's why he said don't give up when, you, when you're under the Lord's correction. He's not correcting you because he's angry. He's correcting you because he loves you. I didn't correct my children because I was angry at them. I correct them because I love them. I love them to this day. And I'm proud of who they become. I'm not always happy with their choices. But their, their choices to make now, they, now it's just between them and God. Some people see the fish in the story of Jonah as an instrument of justice, as a punishment for sin, but the fish was really an instrument of God's mercy. Jonah's only other choice was death. The fish was arranged by God to swallow up Jonah to save him, not to hurt him. And isn't it ironic? The fish was more obedient to God than Jonah was. I'm going to close with this. Jonah was doomed to certain death apart from God sending the giant fish to swallow him up. In the same way, we are all doomed to certain death if God had not sent Jesus Christ to take our sins upon himself and die on our behalf. 
Jonah says, in my trouble I call on the Lord, and the Lord answered me. Romans 10, 13 says, for whosoever, how many are a whosoever in here? Shall call upon the name of the Lord, shall be saved. Jonah chapter 2, verse 1 and 2, he said, I called out to God and God answered him. Some of us are in trouble right now because of your dis disobedience or the decisions you made. And you ask yourself, is there hope? And the answer is yes, because God is the God of another chance. You must cry out to him in repentance. You know, years ago when my son was graduating high school, his mother and I made a deal with him. We said, Steve, if you make straight A's, get a scholarship, we'll buy you a car. And so he went and he got straight A's and he got a scholarship. And I'm going to say this, guys, if I went to heaven today or if I died or God let me see, and he was showing me the highlights of my life, I believe this is one of the highlights that he would show me that had maybe one of the greatest impacts of how I understand the love of God, how much he really cares for us. And so when he did that, his mother and I went to the store, you know the store, the car lot, and we bought him a truck. And, and we had the guys put it out on this kind of pad thing, and, and they, we built, made a sign and said, congratulations, Steve. So when he came home that day, we said, hey, Steve, come with us. And he said, where are we going? I said, quit asking me questions, boy. Get, get in the car. And so he had a buddy with him, and he said, can he go? I said, sure, he can come. And so we drove up on the car lot, and I'll never forget. He's looking at us, and he's looking at that sign. He said, is that, is that mine? And we said, yeah, man. You kept your end of the bargain. We're going to keep ours. And can I tell you something? Of all my life, this is one of the highlights. Because for the first time, I think I realized how much God really loves us. It was such a great feeling for me. I was probably happier to give him the truck than he was to receive it. There was so much joy in me. I, to this day, when I talk about it, it, it kind of, it, it, it just brings up the whole thing again, the whole feelings. And I was so excited. I told my wife, I said, Cynthia, I live for this. This is, the, this is one of the greatest moments of my life. You think that is one of the greatest moments? Because I realized, God, for the first time, how much you try to bless us and want to bless us. And if we'll just do what your word says, if we'll follow the promises of God, quit worrying about what everybody else thinks, following the philosophies of the world that change over and over and over again, then it is your good pleasure to bless us. It's the same principle. He wants to help us. He wants to bless us. And I thought, man, God, if this is how you feel about us, a little glimpse of it, of how I feel to this day of giving my son that truck, I was more proud for him to have it than, I, than he was to receive it. And I realized, God, it's, it's such a great thing. You're so merciful and compassionate. We make you out to steal our fun and keep us from fun, and, and that's not true. You want to fulfill our hearts, and when you do what we consider fun changes. Following God is the only way to go. And if you're here today and you've not judged your own self, you're here in this place right now and you've not judged yourself, and you've never asked Jesus and given him permission to be Lord of your life, this is your moment. It's not somebody else's moment. This is your moment. God's a very personal God. And if that's you in Jesus' name, you can pray today and give God permission to your life and become a son or a daughter where he can begin to work with you and help you and grow you and, 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 and change your thinking and change your life for the better, to profit you for your benefit, not for his, but for your benefit. Or if you're here and you've walked with God and walked away, you know you're trying to run. You can run from him, but you can't outrun him. God is always working with you. That's why everywhere you go, you're meeting Christians. People saying, hey, what are you doing or how are you doing? You turn on the radio, there's something about God. Can't get away from it because God is trying to get your attention to bring you back home. It's like he's going, boy, wake up, girl. But it's up to you to come home. It's up to you to make it the, the right decision, to do what's right, to listen to his discipline and quit trying to quit because you don't like it or the correction of God. And it just is a moment of time. If you'll just say, God, forgive me, he'd be like, I'll forgive you right now. Because my goal was never to punish you. My goal was always to get you to a place of repentance where you'll change your ways, change your thinking, and seek me and my purpose for your life. But that's your choice. He always gives us choices. Jonah could have stayed on the ship, and they would have all died. 
in that storm? All of us. God uses people in our lives. Sometimes he'll use a boss that's kind of rugged to help us in some way. That's why you always have to be looking to him. But if that's you in the powerful name of Jesus and you want to get right with the Lord today, this is why we're here. If you want to come home, if you want to get it right, you want to give him permission to your life, you can. With every head bowed, listen, folks, I'm not going to call you forward out of your seats. I'm going to pray with you right where you're seated, right at your seat, I should say. And if that's you in the powerful name of Jesus and you're reflecting on your life and you judge yourself and you say, you know, I come up lacking God. I don't want your judgment. I want your grace and mercy. And even in this, you'll receive his grace and mercy. I don't want a judge. I want a father. I want his help. And if that's you in the powerful name of Jesus, and if one will do what I ask right now, others will do it. I believe everybody in here will. And if that's you in the powerful name of Jesus, and you say, I just want God in my life, because it's not about a church, it's about you and God personally. You have to believe in your own heart and confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ. If that's you in the powerful name of Jesus, and you say, Pastor, include me in your prayer right where you're sitting. Here's what I'm asking you. It's a big sanctuary. I want to see you. I want you to stand to your feet right now. And if one will stand, more will stand. Just stand up. Thank you, sir. God bless you. Thank you, ma'am. God bless you. Just stand to your seat. Just remain standing. I'm going to pray for you. God bless you, sir. God bless you, ma'am. God bless you, sir, up top. Just remain standing. God bless you, those young folks up there. God bless you, sir. God bless you, sir. People standing everywhere. God loves people. God bless you guys. As I look across the top, who else? God is a God of love, guys. He wants to help. You'll never experience the love of God until you just do it. God bless you, ma'am. I know it's kind of nerve-wracking. You think, oh, my gosh, what will people think? Who cares what people think? You're going to gain a father and someone who loves you and cares for you. God bless you. Maybe you were raised. God bless you, ma'am. Maybe you were raised where you didn't experience a father like this that I'm talking about. So you have to relearn. You have to learn that not all fathers are bad. God just wants to love you and help you. Who else would stand and join these? Thank you, guys. Father, in the powerful name of Jesus, you see all these folks standing, so many of them. And God, they're standing because they believe in you. And now I thank you, they receive a father. Not one to judge, but one to help and correct and, and lead and guide. And today, may they experience your mercy and your faithfulness and your grace like never before. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' holy name. And as you're standing, I want you to pray this prayer aloud with me. I want everybody in this room that's right with God to pray with us in support of these that are bold enough to take a stand and say, I, I, I want God. The Bible says because you're willing to confess God right now before men, God, Jesus is confessing you before his Father. All heaven's rejoicing over you. So would you pray this prayer with me? Would you pray, Father, I believe in Jesus. And I believe he is your son. And I believe he is Lord of all. Jesus be Lord of my life. Thank you for forgiving my sin. Thank you for correcting me as a son or a daughter and not punishing me. I am your friend, and I want you to know that. Jesus, be Lord of my life. In Jesus' name, amen and amen and amen. Let's thank the Lord, church, if you would.